And this session um, will be chaired by Dr. Martin Landry from the World Health Organization. Um, and I also wanted to point out that we, because we do have such a full morning and so many great speakers and we really want to have everybody to have a chance to speak, we're going to be a little bit strict on the time. So um, we will, some of us will be holding up time cards. Two minute, a two minute warning and a one minute warning. It's not personal, please don't hate us. Uh, but we really have to try to keep the time so that we can get everybody in. Okay, and so without further ado, Dr. Martin. So uh, in, in the world of the Health Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs in general, we come across this concept of accountability. And this is something we hope to explore in some more detail in this session, particularly about engagement with civil society, thinking about communities and citizens involved in uh, the monitoring and progress of not only just the indicators for the sake of public health, but more importantly for how it actually impacts their individual and, and community health. Uh, and, and so with, with that, we've got a number of very exciting uh, participants on the panel today from uh, NGOs, from government, as well as development partners. So I'm going to welcome them up onto the stage, and then we'll hear from each of them individually. So first, if I could welcome Dr. Hussain Zanur Rama from Bangladesh. Uh, uh, that's the Executive Chairman from the Power Participation Research Center. Please join us. Thank you. Particularly, 
the rising costs are they justified? I think those are the accountability related questions that you brought. I, if you ask this, six questions to really pinpoint where are the accountability challenges for developing an accountable health system. First question is still, Bangladesh has a relatively well-established health infrastructure, but research is showing that rural health infrastructure is underutilized. Why? Seeking the answer to that is a part of trying to develop the accountability features because it's uh, absenteeism, it's behavioral norms, it's perhaps uh, oversight systems, you know, lack of oversight systems, which are the issues at hand. So that's about the rural sector, where the underutilization, exploring the answers to that will give us many pointers where the accountability initiative should lie. Second is about the urban context. And I think, the, as I mentioned earlier, unplanned urbanization is a massive issue. Urbanization itself is a massive issue. And I think the question I asked to identify the uh, accountability challenge is that why are tertiary hospitals, specialist doctors, burdened with having to do primary care in terms of the outdoor uh, issues? It's because there's a huge lack, gap within the urban healthcare delivery system. And we we'll, uh, have to find out how the accountability there is addressed. Third is about this I mentioned a little earlier. How much of this OP burden is unjustified due to prescription excess? There's a whole lot of issues there in terms of medicine price, in terms of pharma doctor uh, nexus, unethical promotions, etc., etc. Huge amount of accountability issue there, actually. Fourth issue about accountability, 8,000 new doctors being produced every year in the Bangladesh context. But why are quality concerns rising? That's another big accountability issue. The medical education, the, are the quality assurance systems in place? They are obviously not. That's why the quality concerns are rising. You know, new schools without any opportunity for clinical training, and therefore you have these big problems. Fifth question that I ask is, you know, the public health and medical cure are two aspects of the health agenda. They need to be a continuum because at the end of the day, the client is the same, the citizen, whether it's for public health or for medical cure. But the jurisdiction about these two domains actually has not been modernized. There is a, you know, local government ministry is in charge of the public health part of it. The Ministry of Health and Family Welfare is part of the medical cure part of it. But there is a need to modernize these jurisdictions and perhaps establish new boundaries. And that's, without that, you know, like as I mentioned, one of the key gaps in the health system of Bangladesh is that the urban poor is essentially unaddressed by the healthcare system. It is addressed only through projects implemented via NGOs by the local government ministry, but the Ministry of Health doesn't have a structure in place to address their needs. So I think rationalizing the jurisdiction over public health and medical care, that is another key area where the, the accountability initiatives will have to address. And the last one, of course, it's about the health data chain. I must, you know, as I came in, as I said, I'm a uh, relatively newcomer to this area of health. As I came in, I think I was quite impressed by this, uh, uh, you know, the driving force of Professor Azar. He's trying to develop a data system in Bangladesh. I think this is how Bangladesh has really progressed. Maybe not the whole part of the system, but you create change platforms in some part of the system, which over time has to, you know, perhaps uh, look at, uh, uh, create opportunities for larger uh, transformation. I'll just go over this, this is just a, uh, not really focus on that. Five action priorities, and I'll finish with that. One is 
about harvesting the low and the fruits. Now, I think I just saw administrative data being organized and there is the potential emerging. I think that administrative data is one of those low hanging fruits on which lots of use opportunities are emerging. And I think what we can address that. Horizontal accountability is an important issue here in the Bangladesh context. Well, one of the reasons for this low utilization of rural health infrastructure is not just absenteeism, it's because there are small gaps in resource availability. Ambulance has been given, but not the regular money for the changing the tire in this universe. There is a need to create support and uh, oversight platform horizontally. And there is an example, as I mentioned, of the Jinaikal District Hospital, where the city mayor is part of a platform linked up with the district hospital, where they are trying to provide both oversight and financial support, mobilizing community funds. Horizontal accountability would be a key issue. And the other, of course, is about you know, that there can be many initiatives at the end of the day as their actual progress. So progress monitoring is very important and I think it has to be at several levels. System data, facility level data and independent survey data. And the types of these indicators, quality of those would be a key issue. Fourth is awareness building is a very important task actually in the Bangladesh context because uh, we find that in many areas, particularly health promotion issue, but also where they seek the health care. And I think targeted info packs for awareness building delivered at, through various platforms, community level, school, and through the media is an uh, important issue. Last point, and that's my final point, is that health, you know, in the SDGs, health has traveled upward compared to the MDG in terms of the policy importance. Policy prioritization. In the Bangladesh context, health needs to become a bigger national priority. It will not happen if it is only being asked by the doctors and the health professionals. There is the importance of multi stakeholder platforms who can actually attract, who need to come in and support. I myself is an economist, I'm not a health person. I have seen the importance of health and that's have come in that we economists also need to get in line support the rising, you know, aging the priority of health. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate setting this day with some very key critical questions that you asked, as well as thinking about some of these cost-cutting issues like universal health coverage, uh, looking at uh, aging communities effectively. But you heard a lot of attention to advocacy and transparency as well. Excellent. Well done. Appreciate that. Um, Mr. Hassan, if you could uh, go next, I'd love to hear from you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In this presentation, I will take a brief look at how we, in Bangladesh, produce, use, and communicate estimates for health sector monitoring for planning and distribution. First, I will go to the data production process in Bangladesh. There is no doubt that Bangladesh is data rich. With over 25 data surveys in the last two decades, and most of them are nationally representative population surveys with a few health facility assessments. If we move from the indicators to funders of these surveys, we will see that there is a nice blend of partners. While most of the surveys are funded by the development partners, the government of Bangladesh also invests in these surveys. Outside these surveys, we have estimates available annually from SBIs by our National Statistical Office, Bangladesh Board of Statistics, and implementation of regulation surveys by the Director General of Health Services. Periodically, we produce estimates from cell surveillance and health expenditure reviews. Lastly, we have a program based MISS or Financial Information System reporting on services provided by the Minister of Health and Family Welfare Agencies. While this abundance of data is definitely a plus, there is a downside as well. There exists 
substantial level of multiplicity in data sources in Bangladesh health sector. At one side, we have routine data from service statistics and administrative sources. On the other hand, we have population based surveys. The planning wing of the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare uses both the sources for monitoring health sector performance. However, the routine data sources are not linked with each other and there is no current linkages established to record the services provided by the non government sector. Let's move on to use of data and estimates. The current health sector program is in Bangladesh is based on a sector-wide approach popularly known as SWAP. Whilst the sector program's process and output indicators come from the routine MI sources, the program's result frameworks, outcome and impact indicators are based on data from the population-based surveys that we have shown in the previous slides. Now a very specific example of data use for major policy decisions. In 2001, maternal mortality survey produced distinct level estimates, which was published in 2003. The scale-up of integrated management of childhood illnesses or ICI was started in 2002 with sub districts selected at random in 2003. However, with the availability of this data, the, the decision was taken to participate the introduction first in the red district. This decision led to this in 2004, in 2005, in 2006, and by 2007, all the 159 prisoners of the 20 red districts were covered. In terms of other examples of data use for, for decision making includes using demographic and health survey and maternal mortality survey data for setting baselines for the sector program and targeting for performance based financing modality under the sector program modality. Also, the data are used for developing action plans to improve service readiness and program reviews for monitoring implementation and post correction. Communications. <laughs> Program Management and Monitoring Unit of the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare analyzes the data and collects estimates from different sources to produce program implementation reports twice every year. These reports feed into the review of the health sector program as well as reporting of the development partners. <coughs> Survey results often are disseminated through seminars at national and local levels. The primary mode of disseminating survey results are through seminars involving senior ministry officials, the minister, and the secretaries with wide press coverage. We also organize digital workshops for the program implementers. Other examples of data communications involve development of policy brief using Bangladesh DHS results and other targeted materials like the district level indicators. It also includes targeted workshops and review meetings with the government as well as the development partners. We conduct training and publish our research findings in the peer review journals as well as present in the international conferences. Now, let us see some examples of global and local data estimates for Bangladesh. As an example of good match between the global and local health estimates, let us focus on the under five modern periods. Bangladesh DHS estimated that over the last two decades, under five mortality reduced from 133 to 46 deaths per 1,000 life births. According to SBRS by the Board of Statistics, the estimates are slightly different, but in, in close uh, range. However, for under 5 mortality, estimates from the, from, uh, from the global interagency uh, sources seem very consistent. <coughs> Nevertheless, there are examples where local and global estimates do not match. Some of the examples include maternal, maternal mortality ratio, business coverage, and TB case detection rate. Particularly for TB, we saw that there has been a huge gap between the program estimates and the, and the global ones. The mismatch also exists for the for our estimates on the burden of disease from local and global levels. In conclusion, we saw that Bangladesh is data rich, particularly from surveys which are used for program reviews and policy making. However, multiplicity of data presents emerging challenges with interpretation. There is a requirement to include country capacity for data triangulation. For this, we are working on to establish an individual reference group for Bangladesh to analyze data and feed into the global interagency estimates for better reporting and use. With this, I conclude the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really struck by just the enormous amount of data that's captured by others from their facilities.
facility-based community systems as well as these surveys. And you saw there uh, how important it was to exercise and use that data and provide feedback, uh, particularly uh, dissemination. And, and the challenge ahead is the quality analysis and use and continuing to improve that area, which is fantastic. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Ted Ted to the podium and share with us uh, her thoughts next. Thanks. Uh, there are different 
cut edges in the different edges in the cut data uh, and which uh, we are making the OSI activity of the various number of uh, various members of the cut data, including both public and private healthcare provider. And uh, from the China Association, I think uh, they have the sub accountability to the incorporating of China setting, PR review and regulation, individual healthcare provider. They are accountable to the organization where they work. And then another one is they face the accountability by the provincial association and licensing body to meet and maintain the standard and procedure from the community group. Uh, they, pro uh, they should provide the, uh, uh, they need to responsible of the community needs and individual patient. From the individual patient, they need to provide the patient health care. And then another one is the health service user and patient. They can complain the explaining uh, what is their preference and they need to choose the healthcare provider uh, who they like. And then in our country, uh, previously most of our recipients are passive. Now it is gradually changing and uh, uh, most of the client will be passive to the edit. And then parliament, uh, this is very important for the quality care accountability. Uh, I'm going to the cabinet and parliament because uh, most of the uh, parliamentary members are the representative of our community and society. Our union health minister has to answer and explain the uh, resource, resource utilization activity and achievement of our health care service at the parliament. And then uh, finance ministry is also important because uh, it is uh, it can elevate the uh, uh, healthcare budget through the estimation and negotiation process. And then NGO is also, uh, most of the NGO are uh, participated in the healthcare provision uh, through the contracting <coughs> service. Uh, that's why NGO are comfortable for the funder as well as the serving user. And then MOHs are also comfortable to the implementation and program. Uh, that kind of different groups and different interests are there, but many are in two sides. One is the answerable to the, uh, what they do, how they do, and why they do, and then another one group is the, uh, they have the chance or opportunity to ask the question to the other interests. That's all. Thank you very much. It's a very exciting time in Myanmar, the new government, the new minister, policy and strategy and, and clearly we heard a lot of clarity and, and understanding of the, the, the importance of the measurement and accountability platform particularly around financial performance and political accountability and some clear direction going forward. I'm going to invite uh, uh, Ms. Kriti Ramesh from the FADB to the next. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good morning and Namaskar. Um, first, before I start, I would like to thank the organizers for having a at this conference. Um, it's very important for us to be here as we're expanding our work on um, healthcare. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, so, I will speak about um, dashboards. I will speak about dashboards as a monitoring and visualization tool.
So a unique window of opportunity is currently presenting itself with countries um, committing themselves to universal health coverage and health-related SDGs. This not only requires monitoring of these, towards these goals, um, but we also have the opportunity to look at innovative health financing mechanisms. Um, and for countries that have a decentralized healthcare system, there is a unique opportunity to uh, um, to monitor and collect data at the subnational governance level, where you're much closer to where healthcare is actually being delivered. <coughs> so the current situation in de decentralized healthcare in Davao um, or the Philippines. Um, so, oh, sorry. Let me first show you actually where Davao is. So we have a map. Provider. One 
important and, or an important requirement for this information and data. Um, so there are different components that contribute to accountability and I'm going to have, uh, touch upon all of these. Um, obviously you need to have a, a mandate, a clear mandate, um, there need to be resources so that as you for example don't have enough resources to actually fulfill their mandates, um, financial resources, and there needs to be a performance uh, framework against which you can actually monitor this um, performance and monitoring obviously requires the information and then this performance um, there needs to be some sort of enforceability um, which means that if performance is not achieved there needs to be some kind of sanction okay and um, so this was the dashboard development process in the bio uh, starting from the regional framework um, were, um, were developed according to inputs, outputs, outcomes, and impacts. Um, and what you can see is that these different colors show where, for which indicates data is available and for which there is no data available. And um, red, and especially on the input side and on the output side, it's very difficult to get data. Um, and then the second point is that the indicators were aligned with national, regional, and global frameworks. Um, such as, for example, the Philippine scorecards. Um, and this model makes the reporting from the subnational level much easier. And then again, there were different data sources used. Um, one is the regional HIS, uh, different surveys, administrative databases, and different databases. And they were all compiled in spreadsheets. Um, and out of these, out of these, the dashboards were then developed um, in a consultative process together with um, local IT staff and statisticians and, and together with uh, the regional managers and the managers of the different programs will ultimately use these dashboards. So this, um, these are some pictures. So, so far, 20 dashboards have been developed and they will be launched next month. Um, um, so to show you some of the dashboards, um, you can actually see dashboards uh, the dashboards can actually help you um, to see it across the different six different regions. And I'm sorry, I can't really point it out. But across the different different three six different regions uh, in Davao, uh, you can actually monitor the progress um, uh, towards the different indicators. And the traffic light system um, shows you uh, if the targets have been met or how far they have been reached. So it basically shows you the inequities between the different um, and then it, um, the data has also been linked to GIS, so you can actually also map out certain information. Um, for example, the number of uh, facilities across the different municipalities. I think I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> All right. Um, so how will, the, will the, the, how will the dashboard be used and how will they enhance accountability? So again, they help um, to identify health needs in the different regions um, and they allow for wider consultations with other stakeholders because essentially everybody has um, access to the same kind of information on the dashboards. Um, and then based on the dashboards, uh, you can actually plan and correct interventions, uh, which is important for the decision makers. And again, citizens and representatives or whoever is responsible for holding the decision makers um, to account uh, can also access this information and actually ask questions of why which decisions have been taken and why some targets have not been met. Um, yeah. So dashboards enhance accountability in several ways. It makes the mandate of the program managers clearer. Um, it gives them a clearer picture uh, of the health needs uh, in, the, in their constituent, in their um, region, uh, which is an important resource to have um, to information. Then it also contributes to um, to assessing performance because there is an ME framework um, available. Indicators have been standardized, um, and performance targets have been set. It also contributes to more transparent monitoring. The data sources are actually very clear because. Um, each of the indicators has a very clearly defined data source. So basically the managers have to decide which data source this indicator um, uh, 
for which development has been done. Um, and then obviously everybody has access to the same kind of information and it's basically, it visualizes very, very complex data in a simplified way. Um, it has some sort of enforceability because it is aligned with national level reporting framework, frameworks, which means it's more top uh, down accountability, higher Obviously, dashboards alone that cannot contribute to accountability, so it has to be embedded in a larger accountability framework. Um, there have to be very clear oversight of them and enforceability mechanisms in place. Um, obviously, the data has to be robust and, um, and there needs to be scrutiny or target setting, independent target setting and data verification. Um, and um, there need to be communication channels for citizens to access these or patients to access data um, and also complain, for example, if they have services, received certain services. Um, again, just to, to briefly summarize, it visualizes complex data, facilitates consultations between the various stakeholders, uh, strengthens transparency and accountability, and ultimately also um, facilitates monitoring and evidence-based decision making. So it's an important investment to make um, in decentralized health systems. And there are several possibilities to scale up these dashboards, to expand them to other regions, to share them with more stakeholders, uh, depending on what the government here is interested in. Uh, publish the dashboards, um, for example, on a website um, or in newspapers. Uh, expand dashboards, so these have been designed by um, provinces, but you can also expand them to the facility level and have facility level information. Um, you can also expand the data sources, for example, also have user satisfaction. It also opens the door for results based funding um, for LGUs, but you need further investment in the health and national information systems. If you have more questions, you can contact uh, my colleague Suzanne Rock uh, or our consultant uh, Rose Ascuna, who's actually working at Davao, and we can give you more information about the whole development process of the dashboards, which data was actually used, and so on. Thank you. sector have uh, begun to sort of distill 
come together to distill the practices, the best practices for digital development through a series of conversations that were held over a year or more, uh, facilitated by USAID and its partners, uh, which led to the principles of digital development. And there are nine of them, as you can see. They go down from one through four on this, one through five on this side, and five to nine on the other side. Um, and the principles of digital development are um, an organizing framework. You can think of them as an organizing framework to strengthen digital health and health information systems, and also to improve efficiency and accountability of health information systems in the use of um, data for uh, health decision making. I'm trying to see if I can move this down. Okay, I'm going to keep moving on. Um, and so the principles of digital development are, are, are not edicts. They are, I would say, at a high level of abstraction. And the important thing to remember is that these are living guidelines that have to adapt to the community and rely on the experience of the community to develop uh, going forward. Um, Yeah. 
uh, also presents tensions, as we have noticed, with being able to use data responsibly. So our ongoing work on responsible data actually focus on the emerging movement as a response to the digitization trend. The volumes and types of data that are available increasingly will be available for analysis and sharing present new challenges for privacy protection and security. And uh, the basic data, uh, tenet for the responsible data uh, movement is not only is there a responsibility to collect the data, to use the data they are actually collecting, to be able to engage with making decisions, but at the same time we have to think about how we do that in a responsible manner so that people who are vulnerable to harm, um, particularly as you are able to now analyze data sets increasingly with greater efficiency that expose and re-identify people easily, does not uh, put people, those who are vulnerable, to exceptional harm, um, especially when they're already um, marginalized or disempowered in any way. So important considerations for do using data responsibly include is there a potential harm to communities and individuals? How long should the data be kept? What data should be collected in the first place? Does the data include sensitive information? Is the data potentially harmful? Who do we share it with? How do we share it with? And a whole range of questions that we need to discuss. And this is part of being accountable to citizens and patients as we collect health data. So I would like to point out that being both open in data and at the same time being responsible in its uses are important aspects of building the trust relationship that especially development actors have with the beneficiaries of people that we collect data from. And as part of that accountability, uh, 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 the responsibility of being accountable to patients and citizens. <coughs> Finally, getting back to the principles of digital development as we're moving forward, as I mentioned, the principles are heuristics. They are not checklists, they are not boxes that you can check off. Rather, they are ways to organize your thinking, and they also are difficult to translate into practice. Um, one of the important things that I also notice is some of the principles, as you will see, are in tension with each other. Um, when we say design with the user, which means take into account the user's perspective, that may present challenges when you're trying to scale the same digital intervention going forward. Similarly, if you want to be open and you want to have open data, there might be important considerations of privacy protection and security that you have to take into account. So, um, going forward, sorry. Um, in the spirit of this conference, what we would like to say here is that we are here to learn from you. We would, as we move forward, translating these principles into practice, we would really like to learn from those of you on the ground as to what are your challenges, what are your pain points, what has worked for you, what resources have you used, and what resources do you need as we translate these principles into practice and be able to generate the kinds of tools, and resources, trainings, and other uh, uh, guidelines that might help uh, us think about how we use data especially in digital health for decision making, which is both effective, responsible, and efficient. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, some great, uh, great points made about just being a very good steward of data. And I, I did want to just uh, take a moment just, just to quickly acknowledge that, that the principles of, of, of digital development uh, were uh, actually presented and shared in, in Incorporated into some of the discussions in the region recently with the development of these IC10 recommendations. I certainly would invite you to look at those, but all of those nine principles are infused into uh, actually what you were suggesting, going from principles into practice and operationalizing those is what is consistent with this IC10 set uh, that's used in this region. Okay, the floor is open, and I'm going to ask Gabby, we have until 10.35, 10.40, how much longer do we take? So, so the floor is open, and certainly welcome uh, anybody to uh, make an intervention for to get the discussion going. We've covered quite a lot of ground, from key questions to uh, the importance of data indicators and, and data sources, look at advocacy and needs and direction from Dr. Tentanu, for example, the power of dashboards, and some very core principles about the content and the data itself. Uh, there's someone all the way in the back. Or two in the back. Let's start to my right. And we'll, we'll take a few questions and then I'll just invite the panelists to respond to that and hear all of them. Thank you. I'm Dr. Mugira Basne, uh, working in public sector from an NGO called Possible Health. Uh, this is a non profit uh, NGO. And we are supporting in uh, two remote hospitals. Uh, for uh, implementing EHR. 
So, uh, surely I do agree that in order to create accountability, uh, data is really critical and our best practices I wanted to share and then I have got one question to Kriti. EHR electronic health record, really, uh, you know, uh, our experiences showed that saves time, saves cost and increase efficiency, not only of uh, local uh, stakeholders but also the providers. Because we are tracking uh, patient treatment time from uh, you know arrival to health facility to getting treatment, and this time uh, before introducing EHR in hospital, it was like four to five hours. But now we are experiencing it has come down to one hour and like one hour and a half. So really decreasing uh, the treatment time. And uh, my question to Kriti is about. Uh, how to regulate private sector because you showed in dashboard that you have involved local development unit, DHO, the regional director uh, to uh, use data for accountability. Because accountability it is very important to uh, ensure uh, uh, regulation also to private sector. So have you involved private sector in dashboard? Uh, that's my question. And how you are really you know, using data with private sector? Thank you. I think there's a question. I can pull the whole of your Yeah, my question is also to Philippine presentation. So you have mentioned that there is a lot of data about input data and output data is not available. And Mark has mentioned that what they have, they have started using the dashboards. So actually, dashboards also enhance you. You have shown that enhance accountability in many areas. So my question, so enhance to enhance accountability in improving availability of the data. So what initiatives is being there? Is any initiatives to be taken or already taken? So I would just like to know about the Philippine experience. Good morning. I'm also a big fan about the Philippines. I'm usually those um, entities that um, report or produce data are the ones that are accountable for their performance. Um, but what if there's a tendency for them to not report accurately because they're not performing well? So how do we handle such a situation? Also, um, I'm interested in, um, because you are in a very rural area, or, uh, uh, um, the the graphics are easy for us, but they're not necessarily easy for all the stakeholders who might be interested. So I wondered which groups and how much training it took to actually make the data usable for some of the groups that aren't used to looking at even graphs versus any other kind of data. I'm going to hand it directly to my South Africa. Hi, um, oh, okay, thank you. I just wanted to raise the question around um, accountability in saying that obviously I mean we have raised the bar in terms of monitoring and making sure that we know what is happening but to what extent are uh, the um, accountability systems working in a sense that the consequences once things are not working once performance is not working to what extent is that working within the countries thank you um, my question is uh, to Dr. Alvan. You, you uh, are a health economist, and obviously you've been looking at some of the health financing indicators. I find that Bangladesh out-of-pocket expenditure is very high, somewhere around 70 or something around that range. What is Bangladesh doing about this? Okay, we'll, we'll pause there, and I know a lot of the questions were uh, for Eric, so we'll just pass the mic down anyway. I will, uh, what's Bangladesh doing on the out-of-pocket expense? Not much as yet. <laughs> but I think the issue is getting on the board. And I'm not a health economist. I got, as an economist, I got interested into this issue because out-of-pocket expense is a potential poverty driver. Four million people are at risk of falling into poverty due to out of -pocket. Expense. So I think we are at a stage where the consequence of this for a larger issue of poverty is now percolating to the policy making world. 
Now, what is to be done about it? I think there are several directions in which uh, to work on, and I'll just quickly mention three. One is that Bangladesh really had a good uh, initiative around essential medicines, which were priced low. Quality essential medicines program was an important part of the, the healthcare for the poor, uh, poorer sections. That fell into disuse. I think there is a question about reviving that. The second is about health insurance that has not really taken off yet. And look, many pilots, but we are really not in this state. But I think the data platforms that Dr. Azad is trying to promote, etc., may be one of the legs on which eventually health insurance may take off. The third one is a politically difficult part, and I think for many other countries, ground reality is the third one is also equally important. Whereas that much of this out of pocket expense is unjustified. It's due to excessive prescriptions, unnecessary tests, etc. There is unholy alliance <coughs> between big pharmaceuticals and uh, doctors. What's called referred fee. Doctors get you know, a cut from the. So there are health consequences of these are emerging where excessive prescription is now leading to drug resistance, which is a down the line a bigger public health problem. So I think we are not, not doing much, but at least on these three frontiers, the discussion is to get on board. Um, thank you for your questions. I'm going to try to address uh, most of them. So um, yeah, the question about the private sector, that is actually a very good question. And the simple answer is actually no, the private sector has not been involved. This was just a pilot. Um, and it shows that it's a starting point to strengthen accountability, but much more can be done. And um, obviously it, for the private sector, it could be, for example, um, a basis for contract-based financing for the private sector, where you have clear performance indicators, what you expect from the private sector. Um, that is one option of how you could use the dashboards and ME frameworks. Um, but so far, it hasn't been done. They haven't been involved even though they account for quite a big proportion of um, service deliveries in um, the Philippines. Um, the question about uh, the input, input data is, um, honestly, I can put you in touch with um, Rose, um, and she can tell you more about if there have been any initiatives to improve the input data, but this is definitely a key area where investment is necessary to improve the data on human resources, financial, for example, also expenditure tracking. Um, that there are there are some opportunities for um, to, for improving this. Um, then there was a question about what if uh, service delivery doesn't um, doesn't perform? Um, are there any sanctions or incentives? Um, one one way to look at it is obviously the managers themselves, the program managers, also have um, access to this data, so um, they can based on you know based on this data also change their interventions and their inputs and so on. So it's very actionable data actually. Um, but obviously there can be other, and this is why I said, you know, these dashboards have to be contextualized in a larger accountability framework and look at what are the same, like what are the incentive mechanisms that are at work currently already. Um, for example, elections are important, you know, if someone is not performing, someone may be voted out of office. Um, and again, this is a possibility, you know, where you can come in with the performance-based financing um, to actually create incentive mechanisms um, for performance. And then this, the question about, um, for us, the graphics are easy to read. Um, I think that's also a very, very important question. Um, the dashboards haven't been launched yet, and they haven't been shared at the community level or to a wider public as yet. But obviously, again, one of the key requirements is that dashboards have to be um, tailored towards the, the group that they're, that they're meant for. So far, this group was the program managers because you know, they were the first um, to see these dashboards. And obviously, there need to be, for example, an NGO who can help the communities to translate that, that, that data because obviously the communities um, not only play a key role in, in holding uh, the, the service deliverers to account, but also showing the service deliverers you know, they see that there is a problem um, in providing health care in a certain province, and the communities can actually inform the decision makers as well why there might be such a problem. So the dashboard also is like a starting point to ask more questions.
questions, and that is where you can ask about the communities. Uh, I'm Professor Dr. Abutan Amadat, I'm the Education Director General uh, of the Health Services and uh, Director of National Information System. Actually, I have stood up not to have any, actually, any question, uh, rather to explain uh, actually, a little bit of initiatives of the government of Bangladesh uh, in terms of universal health coverage. So we appreciate uh, uh, Dr. Hushan Zidurama, and he's a very, actually, he's an icon of the civil society in Bangladesh and who has ex-advisor of the theatrical government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh. We are happy on behalf of the Minister of Health and Public Welfare, as well as, as a member of the health community in Bangladesh, that very recently, as an economist, he has come forward to push the agenda of the health, the importance of the health, actually, to, to have a high position uh, about its importance in Bangladesh. But regarding the universal health coverage, in the statement he has made, I think it requires a little explanation. But he has mentioned in his presentation, even in his uh, interventions after work, that he is a newcomer in the health field. This is very appreciated that although late, although new, he has joined in the health community to push the agenda forward. But regarding the universal health coverage, although the discussions of universal health coverage in the global scenario has actually come maybe a few years back, from 2010, from the World Health Report, uh, of, uh, as an initiative of the organization, but Bangladesh was one of the members to push this agenda forward uh, in, the, in, the, in the global scenario. And I remember that Rockefeller Foundation was an instrumental factor in Bangladesh to partner Bangladesh to, uh, to raise this agenda in a global uh, scenario. Very recently, because this is, uh, for Bangladesh we have got limitations. In a small area, it's a developing country, and we have got 160 million people. We have got many five in this case, uh, Dr. Hussain Zilurama mentioned in his presentation. But, you know, if we see the definitions of universal health coverage, it has got three dimensions. So what proportion of the population will be covered? What proportion of the service will be covered? And what proportion of out-of-pocket out, out expenditures will be reduced? So Bangladesh is considering this context. We have a healthcare financing strategy in 2032 to actually promote the agenda of universal health coverage. Very recently, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has started uh, a, uh, I think, uh, health insurance program supported by the government in the Tangail District 3 of Ozaras. So the people in the other poor states are being covered uh, for 50 diseases, free of cost, without any premium, for an per family 50,000 data per year. So this will be a scale on success. The second, in Bangladesh, we are now considering, because you know, when this universal health coverage has been incorporated in the sustainable development goal, then as a country we have the responsibility to achieve this goal by 2030. But it doesn't mean that we will actually, uh, we can implement it in the first year or the second year and the first five years. So our goal is to achieve this within 2030, within the limit of the sustainable development goal. In Bangladesh, we have got good success in uh, routine immunization program for the children. We distribute 30 medicines from the community clinics. People can go to any health facilities owned by the public uh, sector, and they can actually get the services from the doctors as well as they get medicine. But we are trying to stimulate these services so that the poor people, they actually get the full coverage. And then, Dr. Hussain Jindulong and the media and the social society in Bangladesh will have to actually uh, raise this sensitiveness, awareness in the society that those people who can afford, they should not be given the health services absolutely free of cost. So they should contribute, and in this way, uh, the capacity, financing capacity of the government will increase. So I appreciate that this question has been raised, and we have the chance to explain that what the government is doing in Bangladesh. And we appreciate that Dr. Hussain Zidurahman and people like him will come forward and join with us so that we push the agenda of health, particularly the agenda of SDC, health in this disease in Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to supplement uh, Mr. Jumayad and also the Kriti to specific issues. One is the dashboard because the scheduling accountability, uh, the dashboard is a very good and informative tool for the managers and all levels of management, not only in the central, also the decentralized system, so like district or sub district level. In Bangladesh, what we try to do, we try to pull from every types of 
MIS routine data in one place so that the decision maker can have some clear picture about his jurisdiction so he can decide. So what we do, we try to make a dashboard not of on DHS2, on our web portal, which includes the data from the DHS2 which is service, from the human resource system and from the others. And recently we conduct trainings at the divisional level up to the district level managers and there they pointed out a few issues. For example, their financial data as well, so that they can decide as a comprehensive decision. So financial data, so that stimulate the need for data, so financial data should be there. So financial systems, education is also another issue. But what's, this is the, I think, the essence of the presenting data. When they see the data, it feels that they need some data to supplement, to fill the gap, to decide comprehensively. So the important is data completeness from which way they can. So the government data as well as the private and the NGOs is required. In uh, many cases in our MI systems we complete the data from the private sector. So for example, if we have immunization data in DHS2 we have almost 100% governance. So how is it possible? Because urban is not directly under this of health. But that is possible they include the municipalities and city corporation. And they are responsible for the collecting the NGOs and others who in that specific area to collect the immunization data from them. And also Upajala and uh, Upajala Health Complex and below facilities, they are in charge of distributing the immunization, the vaccine. So they are made accountable, those use the private sector, the private clinic, who are vaccinated. So they will get the feedback of the immunization. So the immunization that is almost covered, almost. So this is one example how you, we, you create the accountability and you get more and more data. Thank you. Great, I appreciate those comments. If there's one more burning question, we can take it. Okay, from here. So this is a question to Dr. Hussain as well as to it's about, um, you know, you were talking about the horizontal uh, accountability. So I would like to uh, know what are the challenges to establish such a horizontal accountability for health in Bangladesh and also in Myanmar. Thank you. Built in into the design itself. 
there's oversight committee where people from the community are driven, but there are, as I mentioned about the Jinaidor District Hospital, there are additional innovations where it's not just about accountability, but also for support, mobilizing community fund. Much of our rural health infrastructure, the underutilization is explained by the small gaps in resource availability, which are not being solved through budgetary processes. It requires perhaps a mobilization at the community fund level. And I think there are those opportunities uh, to go forward. But I'll end by just, uh, you know, we are discussing data. I think if for, from a user point of view, we need to also be clear that there are several angles from which data becomes important. One is from the manager's angle. So improving management, that's a whole world there. There, someone else's interest may not be so important. But priority setting, that's another important issue. For example, is OPA big important? Should it be flagged as an important issue? Priority setting is another type of end use from which we have to think back about what type of data, who is going to produce that. And then there is, of course, the outcomes, satisfaction, accountability issues. So I think it's also very important that when you are discussing data simultaneously with one of those principles that was mentioned, I think we are also keeping in mind that what are the end uses for which this is being discussed because the drivers for the end uses would be different. Dr. Azad is driving a process and hopefully a supply driven process down the line might create demand. Uh, it may happen. There may be other cases where the demand actually is calling for the supply response. So we need to be clear about where is the demand driving coming from. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, the horizontal responsibility, in my point of view, uh, there is the optimal linkage of between demand and supply information. If there is the too low linkage, it will it can lead to the uh, affect the accountability in the misuse, abuse, and corruption. Uh, if there is a too many linkage, everybody is accountable, and uh, there are many other and different uh, interests are involved. There will be uh, not specifically accountable to anyone. Uh, that's why, uh, but there is uh, the we cannot say what is the optimal or uh, uh, how many numbers of linkage is uh, better. Uh, we could not say exactly. But uh, there should be the optimal linkage and then uh, each and everybody who is responsible for what I mean the qualification of the rules and responsibility is very important and then uh, um, linkage between among uh, the uh, different actors are very important for that. I think so. We are out of time. I want to first of all thank those who made an intervention, but more importantly thank you to the panel for some outstanding presentations and some discussion. And if we can do a round of applause now. Thanks everyone.